like I asked myself when I was first invited to come, you're probably wondering what I'm doing here. Uh, currently I work for MAP Canada, but I'm actually here as an individual, I'm not representing you know, the views of any organization. Um, but my journey here was a little bit, took me a little bit a while to figure out. Um, I'm, as I mentioned, not an academic, um, actually not even that bright, but I, uh, <laughs> I think right now. Um, and that's sort of what got me here. Um, a lot of people know that uh, when the, the, the Prime Minister sent out his mandate letters to his ministers, the Minister of Justice uh, letter had an inclusion around restorative justice, which, uh, knowing the RJ folks in Ottawa, they were all very excited. The emails went out, did you see they mentioned restorative justice? Isn't that wonderful? Uh, which is great. Um, I was a bit concerned, though, by how the Prime Minister had framed uh, the notion of restorative justice and how he wanted the Minister of Justice to pursue uh, restorative justice because he framed it as a way to reduce incarceration for Indigenous people. Now, we've heard throughout the, the week, and you know this from your own work, that the rates of incarceration for Indigenous people are far too high and that needs to be addressed. Um, I'm not an expert in restorative justice, but I have yet to see anything in the principles of restorative justice that talk about reducing incarceration. So I was a little concerned about about the use of uh, uh, the, the expanded use of restorative justice in that in that context. So um, I wrote the Prime Minister a letter uh, as an individual, and I cc the Minister of Justice, and that was about ten months ago, and I never heard anything about it. So I had actually forgotten about it. I figured no one read it, and that was fine. And then I was invited to this forum and wasn't quite sure why, and Jennifer and I were going back and forth about, well, what is it you really want me to talk about? And she said, well, how about a national strategy? And I thought, well, I don't want any work on a national strategy, but sure. And then she reminded me, well, didn't you write a letter about a national strategy to the Prime Minister and the Minister of Justice? And so I actually had to dig it up, and, and uh, if I have a chance, I'll read a little bit of it to get the end, if I have time. Um, but, I, you know, the, the letter was really about the concern about how the Prime Minister was framing restorative justice. Um, and I have to say, um, with respect to the an amazing panelists we've had here in the discussions, I, I do get a little concerned as well when I hear about the, the, the use of restorative justice because the system is broken, and because there are so many delays in the criminal justice system, and because the reintegration of offenders is so difficult. Those are all significant, serious issues, but restorative justice is not the means to fix those things. Uh, I'm a believer in restorative justice because I've worked with victims of crime for my entire career, and I see the benefits that it brings to their lives, those people who've chosen to participate. And I hear from my friends and colleagues who do the, the sessions and work with, with, uh, with communities and, and uh, those who've broken the law about the benefits to those folks as well, and I read the research, uh, and I see the benefits. And I think there's a lot of really good reasons that we should be doing more of restorative justice. But fixing the justice system and all of its problems is not one of them. Because I don't think that's what it's, the principles speak to. Um, as I mentioned, um, there's so many phenomenal speakers here and, and, and big thinkers, and I, I need to simplify things for myself, because I'm, I'm a smaller thinker. Um, so I look at the system and say, well, how is it that restorative justice can work? in our current system. How can we make the system more restorative? And I see some, so much of the foundation is actually already there. Um, if you look at our sentencing principles, they're consistent with restorative justice. In fact, two of the principles are based on, and Andy will know a little about this, the two of the principles are actually based on the restorative justice principles. Right? They're probably the, the least, the two least used and recognized parts of our sentencing principles, the accountability to offenders or to the Canadian victims and recognition of harm. Um, years ago, Canadians were asked what are the most important sentencing principles in their minds, and they listed those two as the top. But I, and people know something that I don't, I have yet to see anything in any consistent way that suggests the courts are actually applying those two principles in any meaningful way. But they exist and they're there. Um, Restorative justice works. Uh, I used to be a very, uh, I used to be a critic of restorative justice. I was very skeptical. I used to be sort of on the, you know, tough on crime bandwagon. I just thought if we just punished offenders more and gave victims more rights in the system, that things would, would get better. And when they did, well, we just needed to sort of up the punishment and give more rights and 
I'm kind of, it takes me a while to, to catch on, and none of that was working. And I began to meet people who'd been through restorative principles, and they talked about healing. I remember at a first conference where I heard someone talk about it, and I wrote that word down. I had never heard that in any of the people I worked with in, in the traditional criminal justice system. Nobody talked about how the, the system healed them. And that was pretty amazing to me, and the research emphasized that, the healing, the benefits to people's mental health, uh, the less fear that they feel, the less anxiety, those are all positive things that work. And there's benefits for those who, you know, there's evidence of reduced uh, recidivism, all those things, these are all positive things. So we know it works. It was mentioned earlier today that 90%, that Crown prosecutors can only go to trial on 8 to 10% of cases. I mean, we've got to find a way to get rid of the other 92, 90% of cases. Most of those people, they'll be charged as a state, they'll be thrown out, but most of those people will plead guilty. So they're going to accept responsibility for something, and they're going to get a reduced sentence in doing that. Um, that, to me, opens up a door for a restorative process, because part of the, the restorative principles are the acceptance of responsibility. So I see the fact that 90% of cases don't go through a criminal trial process as a real, pro as a real um, potential for a restorative process. Restorative justice is consistent with the Canadian Victims Bill of Rights and all of our, our provincial victims bills of rights. There is nothing inconsistent with the two. If you, having worked in the victims movement for 20 years, the consistent message has been victims want a voice, they want information, they want validation, they want accountability. Those things are all consistent with restorative justice. They're in our Victims' Bill of Rights, and they're in the principles. Is there any better source to get information from the person who would cause the harm in the first place? You just said something? I didn't. <laughs> Is there any more validation than the person who caused the harm saying, I'm sorry for what I did? One of the things victims live with, many victims, is the guilt that somehow they caused this. And when the person who did the harm can actually accept responsibility for that and take responsibility for that, that's a healing process. So, so restorative justice is entirely consistent with our victims' bills of rights. And I would argue that the criminal code and the return of this actually has the basics for a more restorative process already in it. Now I have recommended that the Prime Minister um, I should have mentioned as well, one of the things that I pointed out to the, to the Prime Minister was I asked him to reconsider the approach and his understanding of restorative justice. Now, I don't pretend to take credit for this, but I did see a speech that the Minister of Justice recently gave where um, she talked about the use of restorative justice, and there was a semicolon, and then the need to reduce incarceration. So I'm hoping that wasn't a typo, that actually there was sort of a shift in thinking. Um, that these are two separate separate issues. Now, if I said that to my students, the use of a semicolon, they probably wouldn't know what that meant. Um, but you all do. It is just, I'm hoping it's not a typo. If I would, so I had asked the minister, or prime minister, to consider a national strategy. Um, there's some amazing work being done across the country here in Nova Scotia. It's, it's probably the leader. Um, but I know I'm from Ontario, and quite frankly, there's not enough work being done. And I think it's time the federal government participated and led a national discussion on how to make the whole justice process more restorative. Um, and if I was advising the Minister of Justice, I would, because it is, politics is about selling uh, your policies. And we just came from a decade where the notion of victims' rights and interests was about punishing the offender. But that victims were talked a lot about. And if I was the Minister of Justice, I would focus on the benefits from restorative justice from a victim of crime perspective. The healing, the validation, the less fear. Those are things I think the public could get behind. Um, that's not to say that there aren't benefits from offender for, for offenders and for communities, and those are important as these processes roll about. But from a public point of view, I think, uh, if I was advising the government, that would be the role that I would take. Now we know that the, the provinces will take the lead. I gotta go through those pretty quickly. Um, but what could a national strategy ask? What could it look at? What if the Canadian Victims' Bill of Rights said that every victim didn't just have a right to be told about restorative processes, but actually had a right to participate in them if they wanted to? 
What if every person who decided to plead guilty in a criminal court, that their victims were given a chance or the choice to participate in the restorative process? What if in a parole hearings, instead of just reading a, a statement about the harm done, that victims were actually given a few minutes to ask the, the offender questions if they wanted to? And what if every woman who went to a hospital to get a rape kit and then went to the police for a, uh, to report the crime, and after going through those two excruciating processes, decided that this was not what she wanted to do. I mean, I know so many women who've done that, and after talking to the police, have said, I'm not going to go down that road. I don't want to be a part of your system. What if they were offered an alternative to the justice system? Now, Nova Scotia has shown a lot of courage and leadership in the country, but I think if a federal government wanted to talk about the use of restorative justice on issues like sexual assault, that would take a lot of courage. Um, I know that because I have friends who work in, in the sexual violence, and we were talking once about restorative justice, and I said to you, what do you think? It can be used? And have you ever seen the Harry Potter movie where the Dementors come on the train, and the temperature drops about 40 degrees, and the windows crack? <laughs> Uh, that was kind of the feeling. Um, but, you know, it's not, it's not me saying that. You've all probably felt the Gian Gomeshi case. Um, there were the three women who, the first trial where he was acquitted, but the second process had very many elements of a restorative process. Right, the, the, the woman who, who uh, agreed to the peace bond, she said, in a perfect world, people who commit sexual assault will be convicted and when, when it was presented to me that the defense would, in, would offer an apology, I prepared to forego the trial. It seemed the clearest path to truth. Right? That it wasn't a perfect process from her perspective, but when given a choice, the apology was, was more important than the trial process. Brock Turner, another high profile case from uh, the States, the woman said, Had Brock admitted guilt and remorse and offered to settle early on, I would have considered a lighter sentence, respecting his honesty, grateful to be able to move on, move forward on with our lives. Right? So these are restorative elements, these are restorative principles. Someone's talking about the importance of an apology. But getting back to the strategy, why do why would I focus on victims? Uh, if we learn one thing from the American election, uh, for me it was the facts don't matter. All the research that you have done, all the facts that you have, all the statistics, they don't matter much anymore. And that's a sad state, and, and, and we can all talk about that. But what matters is feelings. And with all due respect to the work that you do, and there's been wonderful conversations, Danny talked about it, about you know, being part of relationships and, and all living restorative lives. The reality is that most people don't care much about offenders. That's the reality that we live in. Um, would we like that to change? Yeah, of course. But we need to be realistic. People do care about how victims of crime feel. And if victims of crime are saying restorative justice works for me, then I think there's a much better chance of having the public accept that after having a decade of harsher punishments and, and, and more, justice, more criminal justice. There's lots of work to do and there's a lot of opportunities with a government that at least is talking about restorative justice. There's a chance to make significant change but I think we also have to stick to the principles of restorative justice, which are not about a cheaper justice system, which are not necessarily about a more efficient justice system. As we heard earlier, this takes resources, and to do it properly with serious crimes, it takes time. These are not quick fixes that are gonna change the system in that sense, but I think it'll change the system in a lot of different ways because it'll heal communities. It'll heal communities, victims, and it'll heal offenders. Thank you.